Greetings. Are we cute now? Are we beautiful? Are we reasonably attractive now? No, we're not. We're not. Never have. Never will be. So disappointed. Whatever. Whatever. Just gonna go with it. So anyway, I'm gonna give you a quick history lesson because you didn't ask for it, but you're, you're gonna take this history lesson. It's so one of my favorite historical figures. Anne Boylan. Why? Well, we'll, 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 we'll get into that. We'll, we'll get into it. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. It, it's, it's a lot of history. So strap in. Anne Boleyn was born approximately around 1501 to 1507. Her birthday is unknown. Her father was an ambitious politician and diplomat named Thomas Boleyn and her mother was Lady Elizabeth a wealthy English noblewoman from a prestigious aristocratic family named the Howards. Anne in her childhood grew up in Hever Castle with her older sister Mary and her brother George. She was well educated for a woman in her station. The standard of beauty was pale, white complexion, blonde hair, blue eyes, but she was still considered very attractive. Even compared to a Venus, she was described to have long dark brown or black hair, black beautiful eyes or darker complexion, a long neck, wide mouth, and a petite figure. Before she was even a teenager, her father got her a position in the court of Margaret of Austria, daughter of Maximilian I, Holy Roman Emperor, which was rare because usually a girl from a noble family had to be at least 12 to be in court. But Anne made a great impression and Margaret absolutely adored Anne, a good setup at how charming and smart Anne was. After a year, Anne and her sister Mary moved to France and Anne became maid of honor to Queen Mary Henry VIII, sister who married Louis 1468, bruh, there was like a lot of Louis of France. Anne stayed in France for seven years in Queen Claude's court where she embraced French culture. She learned how to be flirtatious and sharpened her famous wit. She developed an interest in fashion, art, and literature, humanism, and religious reform. Put a pin in that, uh, this is what the writers call foreshadowing. She was popping in France and had a good old time, but her time in France ended when she was called back to England to marry some irrelevant dude we don't give a shit about but the engagement was tossed out. However, Mary, her sister, was called back to England to marry a nobleman with King Henry VIII in attendance at her wedding. And Anne's sister, Mary, and King Henry began an affair. Mary might have had two children with Henry, but it's still debatable. We don't know for sure. But if you ask my opinion, I think probably not because King Henry had an illegitimate son with another woman and he had no problem letting the world know that he is a cheating <laughs> And the illegitimate child was proved that the reason he did not have a legitimate son was the fault of his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and not him. Because who cares about science and who cares about women too? So having more illegitimate children in his inventory would look good for him in his circumstance for what he will later do in the future. But that was a tangent, moving on, along with Anne. Anne participated in a pageant in honor of visiting ambassadors in 1522, playing the role of perseverance. It was then that she showed the English court that she was indeed 100% that bitch and gained many admirers, including King Henry VIII, the entitled sleazeball. Now we're entering in full force annulment phase. So after 20 years of marriage to a bad who also deserved better, Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. Yeah, this couple. The same couple that funded Christopher Columbus scummy line pathetic <laughs> ruined everything Columbus to get some spices or some whatever, we don't care. He's trash. At the beginning of the marriage between Henry and Catherine was pretty good, even though Henry is a cheating and they accomplished a lot together. Catherine of Aragon in her prime was beautiful. She was the daughter of the greatest monarchs in history and a highly intelligent, brave woman. But even though they were considered a power couple, Catherine had a hard time producing heirs. She had multiple miscarriages and sudden infant deaths. 
Her only surviving child was Mary the First, who was going to be forever known as Bloody Mary. Henry got desperate because, understandably, he was under a lot of pressure. The Tudor dynasty was still unstable when he became king. His family was the family that ended the War of the Roses with his father Henry the Seventh winning the battle against Richard III. And as a man during this time, legacy was the most important thing. So this expectation to keep the family name going was the reason why he wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon. But the problem was that England at that time was heavily Catholic and the Pope was more powerful than kings. In order to receive and divorce under Catholicism, you had to get approval from the Pope. Henry requested a divorce from Catherine on grounds that the marriage was invalid. All of a sudden, after 20 years of him having nothing but audacity, claimed that the marriage was incestuous and against the Bible. Before Catherine married Henry, she was married to his older brother, Arthur. But the marriage lasted a couple of months. Then Arthur died from sickness. There was no proof of consummation between the two, so the marriage was considered invalid. But in the grand scheme of things, it kind of doesn't matter. They used Catherine's super short, unproductive first marriage against her, while also using the Bible verse that if a man marries his brother's widow, then they will be childless while having a fully breathing daughter. <laughs> but the Pope was like, get the f out of here, no. Also, Protestantism was on the rise because of Martin Luther. At first, Henry wasn't feeling Protestantism at all, but influences like his advisor Thomas Cromwell and Anne Boleyn herself, who was a Protestant, persuaded him to switch sides. And after several years of trying to get a divorce from the Pope, Henry was like, well, you know, f all this shit. I'm Protestant now. <laughs> that means I don't have to answer to the Pope to do what I wanna do, which is f around. He separates the entire country from the Catholic Church and becomes head of the Church of England. To rub salt on a wound, he banishes Catherine and separates her from her daughter Mary. Trash. The guy is just... Tra the guy is trash. He deserves to be in a dumpster. A dumpster. Catherine of Aragon dies lonely and heartbroken. Shortly after Anne and Henry get married, Anne ironically gave birth to the greatest monarchs in English history, Elizabeth I. But Henry continues his nonsense during his marriage to Anne. He pulls the same trashy behavior he did to Catherine for years, which is constantly being unfaithful. But this time around, Anne wasn't having it. She expressed very clearly that she does not like him having affairs and it caused a lot of distress. But Henry didn't care and continued anyway. Extreme pressure to produce a boy and emotional turmoil and must have been feeling was most likely one of the many reasons that led to her miscarrying multiple times. Enemies against Anne were just popping out the woodworks <laughs> like guacamoles. Plotting against her, which was Thomas Cromwell and the Seymour family as they pushed their girl, Jane Seymour, to Henry. Henry wanted out of the marriage after three years and no male heir and wanted a meeker woman to better control. Like the <laughs> that Henry was, he arrested Anne and had her convicted with false crimes such as witchcraft, treason, adultery, and incest with her own brother. <laughs> like, God damn. You can just stop that treason, but wanted to hammer it home. Anne Boleyn, along with her brother and other men accused of having an affair with her, was taken to the Tower of London. First, her brother was executed and Anne was executed by the sword on May 19th, 1536. Henry, being a <laughs> married his third wife, Jane Seymour, like two seconds later and continued a string of failed marriages until he finally rolls his fat <laughs> over and dies. She has been considered a heartless, power-hungry player, a smoldering seductress, a family pawn, a victim in a cold game of politics, a feminist hero, a studious, highly intelligent Renaissance woman before the Renaissance. And she has been portrayed in multiple stage plays, TV shows, movies, and books so trash for this time period. I have read countless sources and watched many videos about Henry's wives because I find them all 
interesting, except Jane. She's the most boring one out of all of them. Now, it may seem strange for me as a black American woman to love this white European <laughs> but all of it is messy as hell, like basketball wise messy, like real housewives messy, except with actual stakes and pretty dresses and crowns. My female brain is going kaboom. It's dramatic as hell. All the politics, conspiracy, backstabbing, bad luck, danger, the whole nine yards. I fully admit that I am indeed tuta trash. So why the absolute hell am I telling you this? Well, because guess what? It is glorious news. It is fantastic news. It is beautiful, glorious, amazing news. Ugh, waters my plants. There's going to be a new period drama coming out about the last months of Anne Boleyn's life. And guess who's the actress that's playing her? Come on, guess. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Guess. Jodie Turner Smith. Now, who is Jodie Turner Smith? She is a British actress and model, most known for her starring role in Queen and Slim. She's beautiful and talented, so what's the problem, officer? Well, Anne Boleyn is obviously white and Jodie Turner-Smith is the complete opposite of that. And yeah. It's not a huge splash controversy that destroys the internet with an influx of opinion pieces, think pieces, on the cover of Time magazine. It's basically a small discourse for people who like history and period pieces. When I heard the news, I was living for it. I'm still living for it. But what actually propelled me to make a video is after I heard the news, I went to the internet to see if anyone else was talking about it. Obviously it's mixed. Some are hiding behind historical accuracy to criticize it. Some are like, who cares? And, and some are at most annoyed. Then I scroll down in comics because the comments are always the juiciest parts. And lo and behold, it was a cesspool of racism and bashing the radical snowflake left for once again doing the devil's work of trying to push for diversity where it doesn't belong because we can't stand to see a person of color in anything other than a background prop. Those leftist libtards are trying to rewrite history with this revisionist garbage. How dare they? All that ruffled my jimmies and I had to make a detailed argumentative video about a miniseries that hasn't come out yet about some European woman from the olden times being murdered by her <laughs> husband because he wanted a boy. Plus, I've been seething at the mouth to find any excuse to talk about Tudor history. This is my chance to shine. My moment to bombard people with information they did not ask for, but they're gonna get it anyway. I am arguing that some of the very small discourse about the miniseries is rooted in hypocrisy, racism, massage noir, you know, all the all the great things that make this world turn. Also, tear down the whole concept of historical accuracy because it's a myth. So strap in, drink some tea, and let us go on this perilous journey. The casting of Jodie Turner Smith in the role about a white historical person sounded the alarms of colorblind casting. It's mostly a theater term, but it can be applied to movies and television. It is the practice of casting without considering the actor's skin color, body shape, sex, and or gender. I first learned about colorblind casting and dramaturgy in high school, and in my dumb <laughs> teenage mind, in my now dumb ass adult mind, it sounded legit to me. It sounded like the perfect answer to fix a wide gap of opportunities between white and non-white talents. You're not screwed out of a job because you're black or Hispanic, Asian, heavyset, have a disability, or not the ideal of beauty. The only thing that would matter is talent. It sounds good on paper, but in practice, well, once again, all of the isms and phobics rear their ugly head. Reading up on colorblind casting, I came across the article by Armari Newton titled, 
colorblind casting is an absurd and insidious form of racism. The author articulated his grievances when watching a Broadway production of Arthur Miller's All My Son. He found the casting of characters who are brother and sister as different races distracting and took him out of the production. He found changing other side characters who are canonically white to a mixed race family a not so great choice because the play takes place in the 1940s, a time of segregation and interracial relationships if made public can lead to murder, constant harassment, arrest, or all of the above and so much worse. And Newton found the change as an insult because it erases and ignores the history of black people in America. Colorblind casting has turned into another very subtle form of racism in erasure. It's the equivalent of a white person saying, I don't see color, which is called for they are a closeted racist or too lazy or apathetic to acknowledge their privilege and neglect to see the systematic oppression against marginalized groups. It doesn't address and fix racial disparity, it simply puts a wimpy <coughs> bandaid on top and clap their hands and yell, done! We solved the racism, give us a cookie! And over the years, colorblind casting has evolved as another shield to hide white people, once again taking opportunities away from minority groups and the practice of whitewashing. Like for example, the live action version of Ghost in the Shell, Tilda Swinton and Doctor Strange, the entire cast of Exodius Gods and Monsters, the live action adaption of Avatar The Last Airbender, I will never forgive them for that one, Death Note, live action Dragon Ball, and also many other examples. Hollywood loves to use the guise of colorblind casting when it comes to assigning roles that were meant for a person of color. Somewhere down the line, the logic conveniently ends at well, we thought this white actor was a better choice. Sure it was, Nathaniel. I, I, I'm sure it was. And now we're back at square one with the erasure of people of color. So what's the new solution? To combat colorblind casting, people like Newton and even August Wilson, a highly regarded and famous playwright, subscribe to color conscious casting. Instead of ignoring historic discrimination, you acknowledge it. Also take the person's race, culture, and other circumstance into account. With that said, I do believe the casting is more erasure than actual diversity because it prioritizes a story that centers around white European history. Instead of investing on a project where marginalized groups tell their own stories, it would have been better to do a period piece about a black person living in pre-modern Europe because guess what? There were black people then too. I know. Gasp. What do you mean there were black people in the middle ages or the Renaissance in Europe? That is revisionist bull orchestrated by Black Lives Matter and lip tarts. Despite popular belief, there have always been a good amount of black people and people of color in Europe. Like why wouldn't there be when there was slavery and also trade of other goods like gold, spices, and textiles, etc. There were also a good amount of Africans who were free men traveling and living in Europe. Examples. Did you know that there was a black musician named John Blank in the courts of King Henry VIII? And the guy wasn't just there for no reason. He most likely came in attendance with Catherine of Aragon from Spain and just chilled in England. And he was paid to be there. He even asked for a pay raise by King Henry VIII himself. And he was like, oh yeah, sure, bet. There was also Benedict Namor, an African Italian friar from the 16th century, who became a saint because of his long list of good deeds. In the King Arthur legend, there was a black knight named Sir Morin. There was also the biracial prince of Florence, Alessandro de Medici, whose mother was of African descent. John Baptiste Belli was an accomplished military captain during the French Revolution and became member of the National Convention and Council of 500 in France. Also, there is plenty of art depicting black people in pre-modern Europe. Wow, isn't it a crazy coincidence that we never heard of any of them in our history books and we've been fed this false image of Europe devoid of black people? It's like actual racial erasure. If not a story about a black person in Europe, why not focus on African historical people like the many queens of Africa? Okay, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I probably should have looked it up before then, but Amen Irenas, um, Amana, um, Amana Irenas. So sorry. 
Please excuse my horrible Americanness. I don't know how to pronounce it. She led a successful army against the Romans. There was also another queen, Queen Amina, who ruled in Nigeria for 34 years in the 16th century. She expanded her territory to provide safer travel for trade and is credited for introducing battle armor made of metal because of the amazing skill of metalwork in her kingdom. There's also Masa Musa, an African emperor from the 13th century and is the richest person to have ever lived in all of history. Even today with the likes of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg, Mansa Musa was richer than all of them combined. So where's my movies and TV shows about them with a huge budget? It is very frustrating when there are plenty of people of color who deserve to have their stories told, but are pushed under the rug in favor of another adaption of Queen Elizabeth I and II, Henry VIII, Catherine the Great, The World Wars, Queen Victoria, and more goddamn Jane Eyre adaptions. Like, can we please stop adapting Jane Eyre and anything by Jane Austen? Like, Christ, we get it. White women have problems too. We know. We get killed over it. And then these films and shows get thrown awards and recognitions. And what kills me about the whole situation is that a lot of white people are screaming about the revising and the erasure of their history. Like, where? White Western history has been shoved down our throats since we came out of the womb. We know more about how Europe raped, pillaged, and murdered its way into power and rebranded it as spreading civility and religion to all the indigenous area. But we know very little about the history of indigenous people and their accomplishments and their own trials and tribulations separated from colonialization. There is no erasure of whiteness. There have never been an erasure of white culture or history and never will be. I don't know where you're getting this from Nathaniel and Karen. You constantly see yourselves in movies, music videos, video games, books, and art. Your stories are always prioritized. You are overrepresented. And the people who are actually revising history is white people. Our history books from primary school are often condensed and edited in a neat bow, constantly leaving out information or flat out lying. History books are trying to change calling African slaves immigrants. Uh, so what is the difference? The difference is that immigrants choose to live in a different country while slaves are forced. Remember when we were taught that Christopher Columbus was a great guy? Remember when we were taught that in school, huh? Remember that? But what was left out is that he committed genocide to Native Americans and it wasn't just spreading a basket full of illnesses created in Europe like syphilis and smallpox. No, 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 no. This motherfucker got creative in his bullshit and committed the most horrific atrocities. But he has statues and an entire day dedicated to him. All of his crimes were suspiciously left out while learning about history. And it wasn't until like yesterday we realized he was a I am a nerd. I like finding these things out. But most people are not historians or simply not intellectually curious. They soak in whatever their teachers say and move on without a second thought. Also, with Western European history we were taught in school, it is a great time to talk about historical accuracy. The top argument used against the casting of Jodie Turner Smith. Period pieces should not be the only form of learning about history because its first job is to entertain. If people are only learning about history through shows like The Tudors, The Favorite, and other period pieces done by Mel Gibson, then it is the fault of the education system and the fault of the individual. The genre is not proper research. Sources on history. Any historian under the sun can tell you that. If you go into a serious discussion about a historical subject and you have not done proper research, like read books or articles, then please sit down and drink some tea. 
That's like me trying to discuss stocks with a stockbroker after watching The Wolf of Wall Street or The Big Short. Or thinking I can have an educated discussion with a nurse or a surgeon after I binge Grey's Anatomy. Period pieces should just be, at most, visual aids. It is just another genre to tell a cohesive story for entertainment. It's still up to the individual to make sure they have their facts and information right, or if you don't feel like researching or educating yourself, then please, move right along. Name one period piece movie or show that's completely accurate. Give me one, just one, 100% accurate, all the way, all the way down, please. I'll wait, I'll wait. Oh wait, you can't. There's no such thing. The thing with period pieces is that they have to be adapted to appeal to a wide modern audience. And that includes people who are not well researched in history, so everyone involved can pay their light bill. If you had a completely accurate period piece, depending on the time, we'd be bored to death. No one would watch it. It would be boring as hell. A period piece about the pre-modern world it's a lot of f waiting around because there isn't the luxury of iPhones and emails. So it's people sitting around, walking around, doing the same thing over and over again. Basically what every responsible person during quarantine is doing. It's especially true for women who did not have agency over their lives. Women's lives revolved around domesticity like house management, raising children, taking care of their philandering husband, while being the epitome of femininity. You will get more action if it was set during war, but even then there's still a huge chunk of waiting around for orders and commands. The visual aesthetic of period pieces are shot in the kneecaps. Many people who study in period costuming always grieved at how the costumes, hair, and makeup are more inaccurate than accurate. Everything has to be prettified and more glamorous to catch the attention of the general audience. It's funny how people are mad about this historical inaccuracy, but let's slide everything else. Like for example, in The Other Boiling Girl, The Hulk, Black Widow, and Jane Foster, it's riddled with inaccuracies in both the movie and the book it's based on. In the film adaption, Henry sexually assaults and Boleyn. Okay, Henry VIII is a bad guy. There's no way to get around that. He's a serial cheater to the point where it's abusive, a tyrant, and a murderer, but there's no evidence that he's a rapist. At most he's a creep and is portrayed negatively as the story sides with a lot of misconceptions and lies made up about her like the incest. Her being a power-hungry seductress trying to throw her own sister under the bus and uncaring and calculating. In the Tudors, there's even more inaccuracies from the differences in appearances, like for example, King Henry VIII was tall, robust, had red hair, but Jonathan Rhys Myers looked nothing like him. Anne Boleyn had dark eyes while Natalie Dormer has blue. Captain of Aragon was a redhead also, but constantly is cast as a brunette because of the generalization that people from Spain are mostly brunettes. In other adaptions of Philippa Gregory books like The White Queen and Princess and currently The Spanish Princess that are not historically accurate. Or the show Versailles about French history but the cast is completely British. Also there is the instance in The Hollow Crown where Sophie Alcanito, a multiracial British actress, portrayed Margaret of Anjou, a white queen consort of England, but there wasn't an uproar. It could be because Anne Boleyn is more infamous than Margaret of Anjou, plus colorism. We can go on and on about historical inaccuracies in these shows and movies. Y you know what? I'm gonna do you a solid and, and just help you just take a shortcut. Go watch the YouTube channel History Buff. It's hosted by Nick Hodges and it's entire channel is dedicated to pointing out all historical inaccuracies in movies. Period pieces do nothing but revise history. They're almost complete fantasies and many people consume this genre without any research. Cause who has time for that? If you want historical accuracy then read biographies and history books or watch a documentary. The defense of historical accuracy for period dramas is a very flimsy hill to stand on and very hypocritical. Go for all the period dramas and period pieces. Don't gang up on this one because of the obvious. But if a movie with a white person playing a black or POC historical figure like MLK or Rosa Parks, it would have been considered racist and black-faced. Uh, yeah. 
It sure would. White face and black washing does not have the same weights as black face or white washing. White face and black washing doesn't show up as often because of who owns the media and there's no loaded violent history behind it. And it's not even that insulting to white people. Like, look at white chicks. The stereotype towards white people is that they are rich, privileged, and high value. At worst, they are arrogant, spoiled, and whiny. Mind you, this is coming from black creators. Even when Dave Chappelle did whiteface, he still portrayed white people as proper and decent. Blackface, it was derogatory, harmful, and malicious and it negatively affects black people to this day. But how is a black person being cast in a role that's historically white and canically white, not racist and reverse racism or whatever? Racist? I don't think so. Racism is not just thoughts of superiority, it's also actions. In order for a specific group to be racist, they had to be in a position of power to actively and effectively do actions for the purpose of systematically harming and disempowering another group. But black people do not have the power to systematically and disempower or impress another race. So for this particular instance, how is a black woman disempowering anyone? She's not, she simply cannot. An opportunity like this for a black woman is rare, but for a white woman, it's simply a checklist in their repertoire. Many white actresses have done at least one pre-modern role with the variety from being a queen, lady-in-waiting, a princess, maid, stage actresses, many characters who have agency. While black actresses, when they do show up in pre-modern period piece, it's usually about slavery or oppression. So far, the best we got that's not absolutely depressing is Belle directed by Ama Ashanti and Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash. There is a small, small, minuscule fraction of peer pieces with black people that's not about racism and oppression. Most stories revolving around white people don't worry about intersectionality of race. There usually isn't an acknowledgement of it. They simply get to exist. Black people don't have the courtesy. Black stories that are mainstream usually revolve around race from slavery to civil rights. Don't get me wrong, these types of movies are important since, for some reason, the obvious messages of them are not sticking to some people. <sighs> like, can we please just take a break from it? Like, can we please get more stories revolving around Black people that are not depressing and show us constantly in pain and poverty? Can we please get more POC movies and TV shows like Black Panther to all the boys I loved before, Crazy Rich Asians, Sorry to Bother You, and Soul. More stories where black people are thriving, happy, complex, where we get to know them as people and not just their race. Doing cool shit like getting a guy on the moon, raising armies, being royalty, achieving greatness, searching for Meaning, me and other black people like me are so sick of the black struggle movies. We want more escapist content. Like, we are so starved for content about us, we cling on to anything about black people, which is why Tyler Perry is making millions of dollars profiting off of our media starvation and inserts any slavery and civil rights movie, no matter how great they are, like 12 Years a Slave and Selma. The starvation of more better representation is one of the reasons why I'm rooting for this miniseries. I want to see a black woman be queen, even though it's only for a moment, have agency and political intrigue. I want the grandeur, the suspense, the immersion, the drama I feel when I watch other tragedies like Cleopatra, Titanic, and King Lear. I just want to escape inside a castle with flowy dresses and dances, diamonds and crowns and wine. Can I please just chill and escape for two seconds? I promise I'll go back to being woke. Just give me a moment to breathe. The visibility of Jody being Anne Boleyn could mean something more important and profound to a younger generation of people of color. Being a black girl and seeing on screen a black woman play a character that's strong, intelligent, and vulnerable and complex and powerful, that means a lot. For example, it meant the world to me seeing the 1996 live action adaption of Cinderella with Brandy, Whitney Houston, and Whoopi Goldberg. It gave me something to look up to. Seeing a woman who looks like me be kind, 
gentle, imaginative with a strong moral compass, be desired for it, be soft and feminine and treated with respect and have a happy ending. And also crowns and glitter and sparkles and satin and oh, great costuming and makeup. Oh, it was beautiful. It's beautiful. God, I love that movie. It really convinced me that I am more than what the world sees me. For a good portion of it, it is a stereotype or less than. And till this day, it gives me hope and it gives me the drive to wake up and try every day because I want to give that to so many black girls who feel different, comfort, and be validated in their existence, which is beautiful in their own individual way. The story of Anne Boleyn and the Tudors has been done a thousand times before and it will be done a thousand times more. I met when I was reading Omari Newton's article about his disapproval of the casting in All My Sons, one of the reasons my first reaction was, who cares, is that Arthur Miller's plays are so overproduced all over the country from high production Broadway theaters to local theater to high school theater to movie adaptions. And it's because it's Arthur Miller. He's a legendary playwright. His stuff gets adapted so much, it starts to get the Shakespeare effect. Where after hearing and watching it multiple times with multiple lenses for multiple lifetimes, the work starts to mean less. So it comes down to, okay, there's an outlier in casting, but by the next year, there's going to be another production of the same play with an all white cast and the current one is going to be forgotten. It's the same for the adaptions of the Tudor dynasty. It's been seen thousands of times in multiple mediums through every single angle you can think of. This one outlier in interpretation is not going to do a thing. And by 2022 or three, stars might continue with their queen and princess series with another adaption of Anne Boleyn's story. And to risk sounding vengeful, God, it's just so satisfying just having the tables turn in black woman's favor and she thrives. Oh, God, it's just, mm, God, it's good. It's just great to see the hypocrites and the racists getting mad about their already revisionist history. It's like, oh, really? You're mad? Oh, because you didn't get your way this one time? Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Oh God, I can't, I can't imagine how you feel. Oh no, oh no, things didn't go your way. Oh no, I'm so sorry. Oh. Oh, I cried, but I got too much makeup on, sorry. So those are my thoughts about the miniseries with Jodie Turner Smith as Anne Boleyn. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about this. I do hope it's a great show and I wish Jodie the best absolute best and she snatches all the awards this was so much fun to make because i love history history is one of my favorite subjects and i love the tudor dynasty it's so <clears throat> god it's so messy it's great god, it's like a high stakes reality show <laughs> except you have to read well, I kept you long enough, so I'm going to finish my tea and scones and burn kingdoms to the ground with my womanhood. Farewell. Oh, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing in here. <laughs>